Welcome to Life Imitating Movies, a weekly podcast where myself, Mitch, and my co-host Brad, we talk about news stories from the past week from across the internet and the movies that we think have already been made in real life about them, about these real life occurring events. So, you know, let's just get right into it. I'm excited for this week's episode. Got some some good movies to talk about, some, you know, sort of some more lighthearted stories, some COVID stuff mixed in there too, as always these days. But you know, let's just get right into it. Um, me playing host this week, I posed the question for both of us. If you could make one movie or franchise kind of disappear forever, you know, one that you don't really like or you wish wasn't a thing, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So, Brad, I want to hear your answer first and then I'll get to mine, even though I think you might be able to guess it. But I want to hear yours first. Oh, that makes me think. But so for this one, I was thinking... You know, I was like, I go with like what I consider the worst movie ever made, which would be the 2019 Black Christmas, which was god awful. But then I, I started thinking about, you know, there are franchises. There weren't really many franchises. Like, I want this out. So I thought, I thought about a movie that came out not too long ago that I thought was really not great that I wanted to be great. And that was Ava DuVernay's A Wrinkle in Time. Because... I was looking forward to this movie. The, the the story of this space, you know, time, you know, it could have been a trippy mind F of a movie. And the movie I thought was very boring. And so I, I just, that's one where I'm just like, that could, that movie could go away forever. I just want, I wanted, I want like a Terry Gilliam or Gilliam remake of it or, or Yorgos, Lan- what's his name? Yorgos Lanthimos. You know who he is? He did Lobster and, and The Favorite. Or even a, a Nolan. Nolan can handle like space time stuff. But that was the movie where I was just like, that could go away forever. I, I, I the story I want is a, uh, I want, I want that story told better. Yeah, this has been a notoriously hard adaptation to get right. You know, there have been multiple iterations of A Wrinkle in Time, movies and adaptations, TV, that sort. But, you know, I feel like I'm with you where this one, I feel like part of the problem, and there were a few problems with the latest iteration of Wrinkle in Time, but I feel like the one of the problems was that it was kind of too Disney-fied. It was, it was almost kind of made into a kid's movie, you know, and it... Uh, I actually went and read the book a while ago when I was a kid for, for school. And, you know, it does deal with a lot of those kind of hard concepts to put to film. So I feel like if somebody kind of took the source material seriously, this could be a very sci-fi, very thought provoking, very weird adaptation, you know, instead of trying to make it a, a kind of kids movie with the message, like everyone is so special and love is the greatest, you know? Yeah, it was, I mean, there's there were some cool scenes in the movie, like the scene where she's in like the cul-de-sac and like all the same Storm Reed is the girl is the actress's name. She comes out, and they're all the same, just playing basketball or whatever. And like those are some cool scenes. And you saw those in the trailer, and you're like, oh, this one, this one could be good, man. But like you said, it's I think you hit the nail on the head with that. It, they they tried to too Disneyfy it, and it just fail it fell short. And Ava DuVernay is. Her movies, I haven't been a huge fan of, but like her shows on on um, Netflix and her documentaries, which she was nominated for an Oscar for for Thirteen, and, but she's she's a talented filmmaker uh, in the TV world that I've seen. Movie world, I'm still waiting for that one movie. Where I'm like, damn, that that was phenomenal. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm with you. Where I'm behind the people that are in this movie because I think they have talent. Ava DuVernay, you know, she I think is a really talented person that should get more opportunities, and you see her getting more opportunities to kind of flex her muscles as a filmmaker, producer, writer. She takes on a lot of roles. And Storm Reid, I also like her acting. You know, I saw her in obviously The Invisible Man, and I really liked her part in that. Mm-hmm. So. You know, I feel like, again, it was just the direction that the movie tried to go in. Just it didn't really work. So, you know, I'm just going to go right into my pick here. Um, You know, instead of a single movie, I kind of picked a franchise that I wish would just kind of go away forever. And I know I've talked with you offline about this before, but it's the Fast and Furious franchise. (laughs) You know, I, I just think at this point they've gone so far beyond what made them likable grounded movies from the start of the franchise to now they're just 
big dumb action like let's just throw a million exploding cars at the screen with so so actors and just see what sticks you know and and unfortunately they, they continue to make money so until they don't the studio is just going to keep churning these out and i think we could we could do better in terms of quality for even our action movies well, this is going to be another case of agree to disagree because I absolutely love the Fast and the Furious movies. I love how ridiculously insane they keep getting. The trailer for the new one, I've watched it so many times because it is the most ridiculous trailer you've ever seen in your life. Uh, I do know that according to Vin Diesel and according to them, they're only making they're making nine, which is already made, and then they're doing two more, and then that's where they're going to call it quits. We'll see if that sticks, but um. That's going to be the end of their their story or whatever. But I, I, I really hope so. You know, I'm I'm sick of these things. You know, just give me like a, at least if you're gonna make a big dumb action movie, at least give me a different franchise. You know, bring something new to the table instead of look. We know these characters. We've seen them for ten odd movies now. You know, just do something else. Even if it's the same actors, just give us a different premise, a different something. You know, just it's the same stuff over and over again. Ooh, I love every second. I love the spinoff too, Hobbs and Shaw. Honestly, any movie that gives me Jordana Brewster and Michelle Rodriguez in the same movie, I'm, I'm there for. Hey. Obviously, one of the biggest stories this past week, whether you keep up with celebrity kind of gossip or not, has been the tell-all sort of interview of the royals on Oprah and exposing the royal family and just that whole saga, because there's too much to kind of describe succinctly in two minutes. But, um, you know, this is not something I really follow closely. I mostly kind of get updates about this from my girlfriend who kind of follows it. But, you know, it's... It just seems so ridiculous. It seems like everyone is just kind of bickering with each other where, you know, Harry and Meghan aren't exactly clean cut and the royal family certainly isn't from what we've been hearing. But, you know, it's not something that I really pay attention to. But obviously a lot of people tuned into this. So, you know, Brad, any opinions? You know, how does this personally affect your your life? I mean, it didn't. I, this thing was everywhere this last week. Dude. It was like the biggest story there was last week. And uh, yeah, no, I am a, I, I don't know how to put it nicely. I couldn't care less about the Royal family at all. Uh, I wasn't one of those people that woke up at four in the morning to watch the weddings. I, I, I don't care. I watch um, John Oliver every week. I watch John Oliver and he always talks about the Royal family and how much kind of disdain really uh, the people in the UK have for the royal family. They're like, in UK, the royal family is not we're super liked, whereas in America, they're like deities. It's it's weird. He he talks about that all the time. How like they're they're almost way more popular in America than they are in, in Europe. I guess because people love to follow drama. So you know, I, I feel like that's all we have to contribute about that. So you know, let's just get into the movies. I feel like not only was this a big story, but it allowed for some kind of different movie picks than ones relating to stories that we've had on previous episodes. So I'll go first with mine. You know, I kind of looked up royalty in movies and that sort of thing. But, you know, this movie, and I'll explain in a second why I picked it, but I actually picked, related to this story, the Prince of Persia movie from back in the uh, 2000s, 2010s, I think. So the reason I picked this one is because, like you kind of touched on earlier with Wrinkle in Time, I feel like it has so much potential. You know, video game movies, for some reason, have been notoriously hard to adapt. But with Prince of Persia, because the main kick of the game is kind of dealing with time, using time to solve puzzles and rewind and fast forward and, and pause time. And, you know, the movie wasn't terrible. It kind of did its job. It was kind of by the book a little bit. But Jake Gyllenhaal at least kind of seemed like he went all in for it. But, you know... I just feel like there's a lot of potential there for maybe not a franchise, but a pretty good entertaining movie that kind of plays around with time a lot. And maybe it's structured like a video game where there's a final boss and the protagonist has to go through all these obstacles using time to kind of solve interesting puzzles and traps, almost like maybe an Indiana Jones type movie, but with time manipulation involved. You know, doesn't it sound like a good premise? It does. Yeah, this is. This is going to be another one where I can't add too much. Never seen Prince of Persia. I, 
I am a Jillanite, if I may. I don't know if I've coined that phrase. I don't know if that's a thing. If not, I coined Jillanite. But I love Jake Gyllenhaal. I love Maggie Gyllenhaal. But, yeah, that was just one I never – that passed me by. And, like, is that is that a Disney movie? Um, actually, I'm not sure. Uh, it might be, or it might be maybe in retrospect because it was a Fox movie, but now Disney owns Fox. So it might've been a Disney movie, but I know it was, it was a PG 13. It wasn't PG, but you know, PG 13, again, it's all about the box office dollars. You can't go R, you know, but, um, you know, I knew you would maybe have something to contribute about Jake Gyllenhaal because I know you're a fan of his and Ben Kingsley as the villain in this was, was good as too. But, you know, other than that, again, it's just kind of it's by the book. It's OK. It's not terrible. But, you know, I think there's a lot of potential with that. So, you know, that's pretty much all there is to say about the Prince of Persia movie. So, you know, why don't you just go ahead with uh, what do you pick for this? All right. So my pick for this one, I have stretched. I have stretched to the limit what could possibly be connected to this story. And so I went with, you know, the royal family. Who's the head of the royal family? It's the Queen. My movie is Bohemian Rhapsody about Queen. <laughs> I, I I took that one to the limit, but I mean, in terms of biopics, man, it's one of the best. Um, I I uh, I love it. I love, I'm, I'm a huge Queen fan. I don't know, are you a Queen fan? I mean, who doesn't love at least a couple of Queen songs? You know, everyone knows We Are the Champions, uh, you know, and it kind of varies after that how deep dive into their catalog you are a fan of. So, you know, of course, I know all the basics for Queen. Oh, yeah. And I mean, Rami Malek, dude, I am a I watch Mr. Robot, which was kind of like his breakout role. And then, you know, he, he, he's so good in that you're like. How is he going to play any other role than just like this, like monotone hacker dude? And then you see Bohemian, Bohemian Rhapsody and you're like, dude, he knocks it out of the park, which obviously he won the Oscar for it. So uh, it's, 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 it's up there in terms of like, I love musicals too. So musical plus queen music. It was one of my favorite movies from uh, what, two years ago. Yeah. So, you know, I'll agree with you there. Rami Malek is a great actor and I can't wait to see him someday in No Time to Die as the Bond villain, you know, whenever that mm -hmm. movie decides to come out. But, you know, I've no doubt that he's a great actor. And that's kind of what I heard for reviews for this movie at the time where Rami Malek was great and deservedly so, but the movie was OK. OK, I, I, I I, I enjoy. I mean, the movie had so much behind the scenes drama with uh, Brian Singer was the original director and apparently he would just never show up to set. So they fired him and they brought in Ruben Fleischer, who was the director of Rocketman, the Elf John biopic to finish it out. And I mean, I, the recreation at the end of the movie of the uh, of the Live Aid concert. I, I, I love that. I thought that was so good, man. Yeah, obviously with this movie, the music is something they have to get right. And I'm sure if you just have a catalog of Queen songs at your disposal that, you know, is entertaining for that alone. But, you know, this was kind of a trend recently where you just see a lot of biopics. And, you know, I think some of them can be really good. Some of them can just, again, just be by the numbers and just the studio kind of churning them out. But you know, that kind of goes in line with what I heard from critics at the time. And I'll be honest, I haven't seen this one. I didn't really have a huge interest in it. I like Queen. I like their music, but you know, maybe I'll kind of catch this one on streaming or on TV or on demand one day, that kind of movie. That's where it's at for me, where I'm not going to go actively seek it right now, but I'll probably watch it at some point, you know, just to check it out after it's been a little bit. I know. And little tidbit, the bassist in the movie, the guy who plays the bassist from Queen is Joe. I forget what his last name is, but he's the little kid from Jurassic Park. I'm sure a lot of people know that. <laughs> yeah, every everything uh, comes full circle in the the movie business. <laughs> oh yeah. All right. So another huge story from this past week was kind of March 11th being <clears throat> the day last year that kind of halted everything. It was the day in 2020 where, if you remember, President Trump came on at I think nine o'clock p.m. And he gave his address. I think that was when he officially declared um, the, that this was a pandemic. Coronavirus was a pandemic. And that was, you know, half hour later, Tom Hanks came out, you know, that he had coronavirus. And then it was like half hour after that, the NBA 
canceled their season or suspended their season. So it was like March 11th was like the day that we were just like, holy crap, this thing is, this thing's for real. And so, you know, this week, yesterday, or uh, a couple of days ago, depending on when you're listening to this, um, uh, President Biden came on and gave his first kind of public address in the one year anniversary of the uh, coronavirus. And, you know, it's been a hell of a year, dude. How about you? What about you? Do you remember? Was March 11th for you a day where you're like, I know where I was. I know what I was doing. Um, you know, I, I'm sure we won't dwell on this too much because I'm sure everyone is sick of COVID news these days. But, um, you know, I will say, yeah, it, it, this last year has felt like it's been 10 years. You know, it, it has just seemed like it has not been just a year since everything kind of shut down in the U.S. But, you know, I will just say really quickly, you know, what kind of stood out to me was, you know, people always take uh, sports for granted. And when those kind of immediately just got shut down and didn't come back for, for months at a time, you know, that's where it kind of, you know, felt like we were living in a bizarro world. So obviously a lot of things were affected, but that's just, you know, you almost kind of think that's going to be a staple, like sports are going to always be on TV. So that kind of struck me as, wow, this is really a weird situation that we find ourselves in. Yeah, but you know, some people made the best of it without... Without this past year, we wouldn't be doing this. So, you know, we made the best. But so when it came to like a movie to think about for this one, I, I the movie I went to was a movie about an asteroid heading towards Earth. And nobody knows about it until one day the president addresses the world and says, we have an ELE, an extinction level event. And that's Deep Impact, where Morgan Freeman plays the president, obviously. And it's a I love, the beginning of the movie is so great where like the the reporter Tay Leone is like thinking that she picked up on like the president is having an affair because it's L E and E L E and he's like, No, it's an extinction level event and the asteroids coming to Earth and 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 it's just like but like that's what it made me think of was like everything's normal at eight fifty nine and then nine o'clock hits, he gives his presidential address and just the world changes. Yeah, and uh, Deep Impact, I think, is the far superior giant asteroid movie of the late 90s <laughs> to uh, Armageddon. But, you know, I will say about the movie, you know, Morgan Freeman, how could you go wrong with him as president in the movie? You know, he definitely seemed to fit the role. A very young Elijah Wood was in it as well as kind of like the kid protagonist in that, Taya Leone. And it almost kind of, you know, seems like a an apocalyptic movie because, you know, spoiler alert, the earth doesn't get destroyed, but, you know, everyone is kind of preparing for that. And it really kind of carries an emotional weight because of that, because you see all these people kind of preparing for as if it's going to be the end, because this giant asteroid is going to destroy the earth. And everyone is selected for a lottery to kind of hide out in bunkers. And it's just it carries a lot of emotional weight to it in this one. Yeah, I I, I do differ in that I do prefer Armageddon. I love Armageddon. And a, a lot of that has to do with the score, man. The score is, I think it's Trevor Rabin does the score and I love it. And, you know, I think that's one of our big differences is I, I love big dumb action movies, man. I love, I love Deep Impact, but man, I love Armageddon. But yeah, your Deep Impact is, is great. I love, you know, you show there's a mission in space to try and, um, deter the the asteroid or something like that with like robert duvall and and, and um and uh, other people and uh you know the, so you see that then you see the president's side of it where he's like you know they're trying to to do this lottery to get people in to these these bunkers the important people and then you have the third story which is like the elijah wood family story getting his family so it really has like these three levels of, of stories that are just really well told and what was it directors what yeah Mimi Leader who did the Peacemaker and, and then I think she did on on the basis of sex the recent uh Ruth Bader Ginsburg movie so she's an extremely talented director yeah it kind of makes people think you know what would you do in this situation if you were kind of faced with this global catastrophe approaching you know how would people react would you react differently than the people in the movies would you do some of the things that they're doing kind of make up with loved ones that you've been fighting with or would you kind of rush to get married like Elijah Wood does, you know, young in this movie? And it just, it kind of makes people think, what would you do in this scenario? So I always enjoy Deep Impact. It's always a good watch for me. Oh, yeah, man. Good, 
good flick. So where'd you go with this one? So, you know, you were kind of on the same note as me where it's a presidential speech. And I thought what presidential speech is better than the one from Independence Day? You know, a president with more, you know, that's one of like the all timer, like, you know, get pumped, like movie moments, speeches, you know, and I actually just saw Independence Day for the first time a few months back. You know, I'd never seen it. I've seen a lot of it kind of on TV, bits and pieces, clips over the years, just from different sources. You know, it's one of those movies you can't really avoid if you just live. So, you know, I went back and I actually watched it all the way through from start to finish for the first time a few months back. And it was really enjoyable. It's, you know, this is this is what I would picture as an enjoyable yet a little bit smart action movie instead of just a big, you know, dumb one. Like just holding it to a higher standard where I think Independence Day got a good mix of, you know, action, campiness and actual, you know, kind of intelligence to it. So yeah, Independence Day is one of my all-time favorites. I, as a as a tool, I have watched that movie every year on Independence Day for the past uh, twenty years, probably literally every year on Independence. No matter where I am, people know that before I do anything, I have to watch Independence Day. <laughs> it's it's a uh, pretty it's it's whatever. Just people know, and it's I love it. I, like I said, obviously, I can watch it every single year. Will Smith is phenomenal movie. that was like will smith's big breakout movie you know came out the year before right and a black you know kind of right at the tail end of fresh prince uh um, um, um jeff goldblum is just jeff goldblum can do no wrong the guy can make the worst movie ever the guy could be in a wrinkle in time and i would love it um yeah will smith just you know kind of killed it in this he just kind of played his usual self he was like a charismatic you know kind of funny actor in it and you know kind of anchored some of the heroics in the movie towards the end and it was just you know the effects are they this was made in the mid to early 90s so you know the effects are a little they don't quite hold up but they're still pretty good for the time yeah i mean yeah 96 was when that one came out yeah and they hold up and then I'll say though this the sequel that that's one of our original questions what could go away I I understand what they tried to do with that sequel it did not work so with our next story here you really hate to see something like this these days but over the past weekend there was a massive block party at the University of Boulder in Colorado and you know some of the pictures for this just you know looking at students just packed in you know across a few blocks and just you know no one's wearing a mask everyone is out in public drinking and you know this got a little bit uglier towards the end of the day when it was tried to be broken up by police because students were starting to flip cars and cause damage and they resisted arrest and it's just you know really shameful and a lot of people you know had a lot to say about this yeah, man. I, in the article, there's a quote that some kid says, which was, when we are caged up, we need to break free. And this was bound to happen. And that was exact. That was one of my Mitch rolling my eyes moments <laughs> where I read that. And I'm just like, you moron. Like, you're not. It, it's not it's not 1984. It's not Big Brother. Like, we're all doing this so that we can get rid of something that's a, a once in a lifetime thing. Like, let's let's follow some of these rules. And it just speaks to how selfish our society, I think, has gotten America, maybe the entire world. But it's just 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 do the bare minimum for a year, year and a half. If they would have done the bare minimum, if they would have followed rules to begin with. We would be much further along than we are right now. Yeah, whenever I see a story like this, it just makes me think, you know, we'd be further along in the recovery process if it wasn't for people doing things like this. And some people have tried to make the excuse that they're young, they're college students. But, you know, excuse me, if I was in college right now, I would still have the same sense of responsibility to try to keep myself and others as safe as possible and just let's all get through this together. And it's just going to be a year out of everyone's lives where we can start to get back to normal. So. Not a great example, but, um, you know, let's just get into our movie picks here because, again, another COVID-related article. I'm sure people are sick of hearing about these kind of things at this point. But, you know, for this one, 
at least it allowed for some good movie picks, college movies, you know, because it's a story about college students partying. And, you know, while this, my pick isn't necessarily a college movie, it takes place kind of at a college with a college student in quotes, and it's Goodwill Hunting. And for those who are unfamiliar, uh, Matt Damon early on in his career plays a janitor at Harvard and kind of solves this impossible math equation. And it leads to a series of events where people realize kind of how brilliant he is, despite coming from a poor neighborhood and being pretty uneducated. And things just kind of take off from there about him kind of beginning his life and making choices after that happens. And, you know, it's a really good movie. Uh, Robin Williams, I think one of his best performances in this, you know, kind of plays the sensitive kind of like guidance counselor, psychiatrist, that type of role. And, you know, I think it's a really kind of just feel good movie and really kind of touching story. Oh yeah. Uh, one of the best movies ever made again. Uh, for my money, the best Oscar acceptance speech ever was Matt Damon and uh, Ben Affleck when they won um, best screenplay 98 when Robin Williams won his Oscar for that movie, dude, and Billy Crystal comes out from behind the curtains because he had been hosting that year and like get, embraces him. And you can see how happy he was that Robin Williams won the Oscar for that. And I love that. I don't know. Robin Williams would always talk about winning the Oscar and he would say like, yeah, for the first week, everybody's like, man, good job. Good job, man. That's awesome. Congratulations on winning the Oscar. And then after that week of, of being an Oscar winner, then people would go back to yelling, Hey, more like across the street or whatever, which was always just one of my favorite stories. Uh, I mean, Rob Williams is one of my idols. So, you know, he's up there with Chris Farley, Kevin Smith, Don Rickles, Mel Brooks. And, um, and, and as in terms of the movie, so I, uh, I, I, I do some acting and one of my monologues that I memorized was the scene where Robin Williams and Matt Damon are on the bench and Matt and Robin Williams is kind of telling him, you know, you're just a kid. You don't, you don't know everything. And that's it's like one of my all time favorite speeches. Yeah, that is that is an all timer where they're kind of sitting on the bench in the park and he goes through, you know, I thought about what you said to me and it started to bother me. But then I realized you're just a kid and it kind of runs through the life experiences that Matt Damon's character doesn't have yet. And that 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 is such a great monologue. And, you know, this movie certainly hits different after Robin Williams' death and kind of makes you even more emotional kind of watching some of the scenes that he's in. And some of the things that he's saying and getting across with the dramatic moments with his character. And, you know, what else can I say about this? It, it's just a really good movie. It's has some struggle in it. You know, it's not just a, you know, warm kind of spoonful of nostalgia and, you know, kind of good feelings the entire time. But at the end of the day, you know, watching this whole thing from start to finish, it's still just a really good feel good movie that, you know, kind of makes you appreciate life and those around you a little bit more after watching it. 100%. I mean, that movie at the end, the whole, the message of the movie is go after your dream. Like the end is, is Damon goes after the girl and it's kind of just like, don't wait for the life to pass you by really. And it's, it's a movie that if you're ever in a slump in your own life, that's one to watch where you're just like, that's, that's, that's the one. Yeah. Maybe, so, maybe a movie to check out these days, of course. And, you know, I hadn't seen it in a while. So talking about it just makes me want to go back and watch it now. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So my movie was, you know, this movie talks about the cops and the and the body cam footage and they're, they're this big party or whatever. So I tried to think about a movie that took place at a big party. And I was so I just went with the classic Super Bad because Super Bad, man, the cops in the movie, Bill Hader, Seth, Seth Rogen, they're like the best part of the movie. Because my favorite scene in that movie is when um, McLovin and, and the cops and they're sitting there shooting the gun or whatever. <laughs> and um, then they hear the sirens and Bill Hader goes, cops, and they get in the car and they take off. It's like one of my favorite funny scenes ever. Yeah, Superbad, uh, I think, is an all timer. It's one of those solid mid 2000s comedies, you know, just uh, a Judd Apatow, Seth Rogen, you know, just all these familiar names that have kind of popped up in all these different familiar mid 2000s comedies that were really solid at the time. And you know, this was a movie kind of featuring a lot of these actors pretty early on in their careers, such as Jonah Hill, Michael Sarah, Christopher Mintz Plass, uh, Emma Stone and Seth Rogen. You know, people kind of knew who he was at the time, but maybe kind of made him a little bit of a bigger, more household name with this one. 
or maybe just kind of put him on the map a little bit more where he started kind of that path where he was more well known amongst people. Yeah. So the story is, I guess he wrote super bad when he was like 14 and with the goal of playing the Jonah Hill character. But then by the time they went to make it, he, you know, had to come to the realization he was too old to play the high school kid. And uh, so he, you know, he took on the cop role, which honestly I'm thankful for because like I said, the cops in that movie, my favorite part of that movie. I will say if you're looking for Seth Rogen acting as a high school kid, go watch Freaks and Geeks, you know, because that's a very underrated show. And he was behind that one as well a little bit. So, you know, I will say if you, you're looking to get your fix of Seth Rogen as a high schooler, go watch that instead. But super bad. You know, this is a great comedy. I would hate to watch this with my parents, but, you know, it's a very kind of crass and crude, you know, comedy, but still, again, has kind of uh, some emotional weight to it about the message that it's trying to get across at the ending with the two friends kind of having to go their separate ways, you know, entering college. Yeah. And that kind of goes back to um, like our previous episode where I talked about, you know, your friends growing up and, and going, going um, your separate ways, but trying to keep, keep everybody together. And that's exactly. Yeah. And then I just like, yeah, that was like the first movie I think where I ever saw Emma Stone. And obviously she's become like one of the biggest stars in the, the world starring in La La Land, which is like, you know, number three on my all time list. So good flick. Yeah. And I still quote a lot of the movie to this day. You know, if I'm kind of left on my own by somebody, I just say, what am I supposed to eat by myself? Like I'm Steven Glansberg. <laughs> you know, just yeah. there's so many great quotes of this one. I still like watching this one to this day. All right. So next on the list is, uh, so if you'll notice in all these weeks of episodes, the space stories, I'm, I tend to pick those. I enjoy, I'm a space guy. I, I, I enjoy space. So there was a story this past week about a meteorite that fell just randomly into a UK driveway. There was video of like a bright light in the sky. People took video of it. And then just this little black rock fell on this guy's driveway. And, and, um, he gave it over to the scientists to, uh, to examine. And they say that the, the meteorite has some of the components that could be, that could to make up life. Yeah. Can we, can we go just one week without you picking a space related story? I mean, it's, it's every week, you know, it's like you comb the internet for just space related stories. I do. I do. <laughs> but, no, but, um, yeah, I mean, this would be pretty strange and just really out of the blue if this happened to you in real life, if a meteorite just falls in your driveway, no matter how small, let alone kind of contain some interesting components like that, that this scientist was able to analyze. So, you know, it's one of those funny stories that, you know, you're thinking, wow, how would I react if this happened to me? And therein lies the question I wanted to ask. So... A meteorite. Let's say you go out and you find a meteorite in your driveway, right? And so this guy handed it over to science. Probably got nothing for it, hand over science. There are probably collectors out there who would pay $10 million for you to give them your meteorite. So my question therein is, the guy comes to you and says, I'll give you $10 million for this meteorite to land in your driveway. Or science comes to you and says, we want to study this thing. Can we have it? Which lane are you taking? I mean, come on, if you, if the, the meteorite falls in your driveway and then you ha immediately have two people walk up to you and then one says, I'll give you $10 million or the other one says, let me study it for science for free. Of course, personally, you would take the $10 million, but, you know, for greater humanity purposes, you like to think you would give it to science for them to analyze and maybe answer a few questions that they have. But come on, I mean, who's not going to take the money? Yeah, that's exactly. I, I didn't even for a second. Like I, when I was posing, it's not like in the story, like the story isn't about the guy got offered money or anything. Like, I, I don't think he was offered money. It was just, it was just what went through my head. I, I guarantee there's somebody out there who would pay good money. There are people on eBay who bought a bag of Kanye West air for like, you know, $10,000. There are people out there who spent money on some stuff, but it was just like this question of like, would you go the moral route and have them study this rock and potentially or would you take the $10 million and be set for the rest of your life? And for me, it was like $10 million or $5 million, $1 million. I mean, it, it, whatever sets me for the rest of my life, I'm there. 
I'm not quite sure that's how it works where a small meteorite lands in your driveway and someone just immediately offers you money, but you know, to each their own. So, you know, I'm sure you picked relating to this, obviously another space movie. So, you know, why don't you, uh, now yeah, why don't you go ahead and, and say what you picked? So I picked, uh, I don't have the visual representation right now, but, uh, I picked a movie about a person finding a meteorite and uh, walking it around and everybody thinks it's this great thing only to find out that it was a uh, frozen poop particle from an airplane. And that movie is Joe Dirt. Uh, you ever seen Joe Dirt? No, this, uh, <laughs> I think this might be another movie that we differ on where I've heard good things about it, but it seems like to me maybe a little bit of a dumber comedy. So I, I can't say I've seen it before. I mean, I love David Spade, and and it, it is it's a dumb comedy, but it's a it's a good funny comedy, and it actually has part if, if memory serves because it is about how everybody treats him like he's a giant moron, which isn't helped by the fact that he's wheeling around a thing that he considers to be a meteorite, only to realize that it's a giant, it's a big piece of you know airplanes when they 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 have they, uh, people use the restroom, they they let it go, and apparently that's what happened the airplane did a release in the midair and that fell to earth and that's what he carries around as a meteor right <laughs> i mean it's 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 a dumb movie but it's a, it's a it's a it's a it's a sunday afternoon movie if you will it's not something you're gonna you know plop down on date night but <laughs> you're flipping through the channels you might be like i'll check this out man i like david spade I would hope not. If Joe Dirt is a go-to movie for date night, I think you're doing it wrong. But, you know, uh, it seems like you really genuinely like this movie. You know, what can you say about David Spade as an actor? Because he's always kind of struck me as somebody who I was almost surprised that he kind of didn't get more roles when he was kind of in movies and kind of acting in his prime, so to speak. So, you know, what did you kind of think about the job that he did in this particular movie? I mean, this is, in all honesty, it's kind of like his biggest role because obviously, like I said, Chris Farley is my idol. Like that's for life. That guy is always who I looked up to. And so Tommy Boy, Black Sheep, are high up on my list of, of, of comedy movies. And, and, and that him and Farley together was like, that was Abbott and Costello of our time. That was, you know, that, that was the comedy duo. And so, obviously, when Farley passed away, you know, he went on to make his own movies. He did Joe Dirt, he did Dick Roberts, uh, and he's been in all the, you know, most of the Adam Sandler movies because they stay pretty tight knit or whatever. But it, I think Spade's real talent, you know, he's not picking Oscar-winning movies, but he, he does a, he does like his his thing is his stand-up and his like Hollywood skewering is kind of what he's known for. And for me, I think the dude's hilarious. Yeah, he's definitely kind of a solid comedy actor. You know, I, I wouldn't say I really see him taking on dramatic roles either. I, I'm always just surprised that he wasn't maybe featured in as many movies kind of in his heyday that people were kind of coming to him, wanting to him to be in a comedy of sorts. So, you know, a little bit surprising. I always thought he was a pretty decent actor. And obviously, he just kind of kind of side parts in a lot of Adam Sandler movies, which are We've, we've kind of talked about it on the show before, varying degrees of success. But, you know, good for him that he was able to kind of make an impression on these people and that there are Joe Dirt fans out there. Oh, yeah. Well, he, he had a lot of success on TV. He had two kind of long-running shows, Just Shoot Me and Rules of Engagement. So he's been, he's, he's been out there. Yeah, well, we only talk about movies on the podcast. So, you know, the oh, TV. So, so sorry. <laughs> so I guess uh, I went a little bit different than mine. I, I related it more to the story about uh, space and meteorites and that sort of thing. So I went a little unexpected with it. Um, and actually, I, I just said that we only talk about movies on the podcast. But something that just reminded me of it with this story, Meteorite, uh, if you ever watched the show Smallville, a lot of the meteorites that they talk about on the show are really kryptonite. So that made me think of the movie Man of Steel. And this one is maybe a little bit relevant these days because obviously you have Zack Snyder's Justice League coming out and a movie was just announced that they're going to do another Superman story movie, whatever it may be but with a black actor in the lead. And 
people are kind of saying, well, what's going to happen with Henry Cavill? Because he has a lot of fans from his time as Superman in obviously Man of Steel, Batman v Superman and Justice League. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with that, you know, what he is going to go on to do or not do in terms of being Superman. But Man of Steel, you know, this is where it all kind of started for this DC universe that we still have kind of going on. Uh, yeah, Man of Steel. I like Man of Steel. That was like that was actually produced by Nolan. The first one was produced by Nolan, and I think he stepped away. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, you had Kevin Costner who played his father. I, I love Kevin Costner, so anything Kevin Costner's in, I'm there for. Um, Amy Adams, another phenomenal actress, and you know, I remember it's it's not one. I'm not a huge DC universe person with the exception of the Batman movies uh, and Joker and stuff, but the DC universe that's been built up, I, I, I think they're okay. They haven't been my favorite movies. That's fair. I mean, I think this one was a little bit different because it took some time for this one to sink in when I saw it in theaters for me to like it because they really leaned into his alien origins. You know, they really hammered home the Krypton stuff and the fact that he's an alien and, comes from another world and you know i feel like that's something that isn't really touched on that much in other superman movies that sure it's there in the background but they really just go okay you know the story is from another planet and then they just jump into him being on earth and being superman not having to kind of adjust to a different planet or a different people so you know it took some time for that to kind of sink in but i do appreciate in hindsight that they kind of went into some of that stuff in man of steel yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I, I think I've only ever seen the, the the first Superman. I saw Man of Steel, but in terms of the old Superman, but I think I only watched the first one with Christopher Reeves. But the bigger point that you had touched on earlier was like, that's true. Where are they going with the DC Extended Universe? Because it almost seems like the Zack Snyder part of Justice League coming out feels like a capper, like that's going to be the end of the universe. But then they have the Flash coming out, which is going to continue the universe. So I don't where I don't know where they're going with all that. So when Zack Snyder's Justice League comes out next week, I think it'll be a turning point because it'll judge whether or not Warner Brothers maybe wants to stick in that direction a little bit, depending on how many people watch it and really praise it, or they say, like you said, this is a capper and this is the end of this era and we're gonna go in a different direction with the movies going forward. So I think it could be an interesting turning point. If it gets enough support and if it gets, you know, millions of views and a lot of people watch it and talk about it, maybe they kind of reconsider where they're going and say, you know what, maybe we bring Zack Snyder back and we kind of hear his vision for some of these movies and bring him on as a producer on a lot of this stuff and kind of steer a little bit more towards his vision that he kind of started this whole thing with. Yeah, yeah. And in terms of Zack Snyder, from, from my last point on this, I think will be... Uh, I, I'm looking forward to Army of the Dead, man. Him stepping back into a zombie world, man. His, his Dawn of the Dead was so good. So I'm really looking forward to Army of the Dead. Yeah, I feel like we haven't gotten a good zombie movie in a while. And this one does certainly look entertaining, if nothing else. So I am looking forward to catching that one, too. So I will say, last thing about Man of Steel. Um, you know, again, people are like it, don't like it, depends. But for me, the scene where he kind of figures out how to fly in that movie really just great scene really great visuals i love the score by hans zimmer he's one of my favorite movie composers so it's just a really great scene that i think no matter what you think about the movie overall that people have to agree that that is a a really great scene in there. oh yeah and i'll just say with hans zimmer i saw him in concert what, three years ago best concert i ever saw in my life dude so good so, you know, a more lighthearted story from this past week is that people who like fast food and kind of keep up with stuff coming out that people are trying to, you know, kind of try new products during these times where people are getting a lot of takeout. Um, Taco Bell is bringing something back that they haven't had in, in five years, which is the, if I'm saying it right, queso lupa. So basically what this is, it's a chalupa with like kind of cheese baked into it that's kind of gooey and stretchy and you know, it seems pretty good on paper. So, you know, good on them for kind of bringing back something that they haven't had for years. And, you know, a lot of places seem to be kind of trying out things to see what'll stick for 
what people are getting through drive throughs these days. So, you know, were you thinking about trying this when you kind of saw this story or, you know, a Taco Bell fan in general? I mean, I am a Taco Bell fan, obviously. Um, no, man, I just, well, BTS, man, we, we send our stories to each other on Wednesday. We don't know what we're going to pick. And, and yeah, I'm always, I'm always interested. I'm like, what's, what, what Mitch pick this week? I see this. I'm like, oh, this man's playing his, playing to his audience, man. He knows, he knows who, he knows who his co-host is. And, uh, but with the case of Lupa, you know, as I said, I hadn't been there in five years. I've never had it. Uh, reading the article though, I'm like, Ooh, I'm going to be getting one. I mean, that, that sounded delightful. <laughs> Yes, anyone who, who knows me knows I am a Taco Bell fan as well. It's probably my favorite fast food place. So, you know, definitely looking forward to this one. And again, you know, uh, places got to keep it fresh these days, you know, just bring back new menu items, create new ones to try and entice people because people right now are still, and this might change in the near future with more people being vaccinated, but people are still getting a lot of, a lot of takeout and a lot of drive through Oh, yeah. And I don't know if you noticed at the end of the article, the next article that they had linked to was that Taco Bell is testing out a chicken sandwich taco. <laughs> I, was, I saw that. And I'm like, that sounds like it will give me a heart attack, but I'm going to get one if it comes out. Yeah, they always they always test out uh, new products in different markets. And I always think, why can't I live in the market where they, they test out <laughs> yeah. something new so I can get my hands on it, even if it doesn't take off and they don't make it available mm-hmm. nationwide. So, um you know, I bet you can't guess what movie I picked relating to this story, and I'll get to the reason why I picked it, but the movie I picked relating to this story is actually Logan, the 2017, I believe it was, movie about Wolverine that came out that really took a, a different turn from the previous X-Men movies. You know, got to stick with the superhero movies. You know, we, we talk about them all the time on the show. So the reason I picked this one is because um, the first scene that you see Uh, Charles Xavier, played by Sir Patrick Stewart, he's a little bit senile and he's kind of ranting and talking about different things, kind of tuning into different things out there with his his powers. And he talks about the new quesalupa from Taco Bell. And, you know, that's actually a line in the movie that seeing this story instantly made me think of that. So, you know, Logan, a lot of people like this movie. A lot of people like the direction that it went in with the character. You know, what did you think of it when you first saw it? First off, that's an impressive memory on you to freaking connect the, a single line from Logan to the story. Uh, uh, for me, Lo- yeah, I absolutely love Logan. I love that it was after Deadpool came out, so they embraced the R rating for it, which made it more violent, but also made it more uh, a more human movie than just a superhero movie. Um and, and uh, if, I don't know if you saw the on video, they had released something called Logan Noir uh, on its first pressing, which was just a black and white version of the movie. And I, I liked it, man. I, I, I appreciate a nice black and white kind of movie. They did the same thing with Mad Max Fury Road. But yeah, Logan's for not in terms of X-Men movies. That's probably the, my favorite one. Yeah, I think a lot of people would probably put it in their top three for that franchise. And I like the fact, like you said, this was R-rated, and I like the fact that it showed the studios that, hey, if you make a good R-rated movie, people will show up and people will pay to see it because the rumor is that, you know, if you make a R-rated movie, PG-13 is where you make the most profits, no matter what the story is about. Even if it calls for more mature content, you still have to make it PG-13 to really make a buck. So, you know, I'm glad that this kind of disproved that. And you're right, it was very dramatic and it was very adult, but I think the movie was all the better for it because those kind of movies let you really delve deep into the character. And we certainly got that in this one. Uh, you know, Hugh Jackman just like killed it in this movie as the character. 100%. I, I think the reason Logan for me was so great was that I did not like at, like all, at all the previous two Wolverine solo movies. I, I didn't like them at all. So this one came out and it had a great director. I think it was James Mangold is the director of this one. And so I was like, and it's R and it just looked more gritty than, than any of the other ones, less comic booky. And so I think maybe the juxtaposition of that one versus the two previous movies made me love it all the more. Yeah. No, I'm with you on that where I think the previous two kind of, solo wolverine movies and it's um 
I think it's just called the Wolverine. And then I think the one before that was Wolverine, X-Men Origins Wolverine or something like that. But I'm with you where both of those were kind of subpar. And, you know, it almost kind of makes all the previous ones that this character has been in a little bit silly because you think, how do we ever have PG-13 bloodless, you know, kind of movie with this guy who has metal claws that come out of his hands that he kind of slashes people with? And it's, you think, OK, how do we ever have a movie where it was just, you know, there was no blood or no anything? It was almost kind of a little nonviolent with this this guy who has these weapons, you know, before Logan. I'm trying to remember, but I, I may have to click on it. I th- was the Wolverine R-rated, the one that was in, in Japan? I don't believe so, and, you know, I may be wrong on that. But, again, it just – I feel like it was probably PG-13 because studios are just obsessed with the notion that that is where you get the most profits because it makes it available to more people to see. But, you know, I just – if you make a good R-rated movie, people will certainly turn out for it and – you know, like you mentioned Deadpool, it's a smart decision by Marvel to keep that property R-rated because it really is the truest version to the character that you let them kind of flex what they're famous for and really have the jokes and, you know, the things that happen in the movies that really lets you take advantage of that rating and stay true to the character at the same time. And to that point, I just clicked on the IMDb for the Wolverine. It was PG-13, but it was also James Mangold which yep. I didn't know, which kind of lets you know the difference between that PG-13 and that R. You get the talent, and you let them do their thing, they're going to turn out a Logan. Exactly. So uh, to switch up my gear, so um, yes, in previous weeks, you know, Taco Bell story, my brain is automatically going to go to Demolition Man because that, you know, Demol- Taco Bell is the, the one that survived the restaurant wars, but I already talked about that one, so I went – I said, I wanted to do a, a superhero of a different kind. And I said, food truck drivers from the movie Chef. Those are superheroes of our day because, you know, I, Chef for me, uh, I think I say this all the time and I might be getting repetitive, but it is one of my favorite movies. <laughs> uh, I think I have a lot. I get, a, I get crap all the time for people telling me, you, you like too many movies. Yeah. And I'm like, well, you know, what are you going to do? But Chef is one of those movies. It's just such a feel good movie. It's just a simple, great movie feel good movie man yeah it's i'm with you where it's it's just a it's just a delight it's just a simple feel good movie it's a simple premise a guy just makes a decides to open a food truck and just bonds with his son and just it's a really simple premise it's a quick watch it's got good acting what more could you want from it you know i highly recommend people check it out if they haven't seen it and let's be honest, they probably haven't because it's a, a smaller movie. It's not a big studio movie. It's not one that a lot of people were really kind of talking about when it came out. So it's probably flown under the radar for a lot of people. But it's definitely a high recommendation for me because, again, it's just a delightful watch. It's just a nice feel-good story. And it's a really entertaining in terms of the food and just watching that get made and really makes you hungry, of course, but I think it's just, at the end of the day, it's just a really good movie. Yeah, man, and I mean, it has one of my favorite stories of, from my personal life. I may, I may have told this before, I can't remember, but uh, I'll try to be quick, but it was my father and I were just, you know, hanging out one day, and I was just, we were just like, I was just like, you want to go see a movie or something, dude? And he was like, there's nothing really out. There's no big screen movies I want to go see, like, a, like a, you know, Transformers or a big action movie, something that's like big screen, you know, and, uh, so I was just like, well, I really want to see this movie Chef. You know, I love John Favreau and I love everybody that's in it. Let's go see this movie Chef. And he's like, he's like, that's not a big screen movie. That's not that's something you you watch on video in your own house. I'm like, yeah, but you know, we're just, we're just gonna go see a movie, you know. And he's like, all right, let's go. And it turned out to be obviously a memory that has stuck with me for you know, a movie came out I think 2004. So what 16 years 15 years whatever um because i, I will know, just say just, actually it's 2014 so you're off by about 10 years was it 2014 yeah i guess that makes sense it wouldn't have been 2004 2014 okay so six years wow we may edit that part because i don't want to look that dumb <laughs> but um uh, uh it's, i'm just kidding go ahead and keep it in but uh yeah so 2014 so but yeah, it was just like this story, you know, a sim- those simple stories in your life that stick with you is, is, you know, just my father and I going to see this movie. And I remember after the movie ended, we were both like, that was a great movie. 
you know, I was like, aren't you happy that you, you know, we came out and saw this movie? It didn't have to be a big, you know, SFX Latin movie or anything. And he's like, yeah. And then on the way home, we stopped at Chick-fil-A, you know, ate our Chick-fil-A, had a nice meal and everything. It's just, it's just one of those simple days that I will, you know, I remember for the rest of my life because it was just a great day with my pops. And I think you're right. I think that story kind of relates to the movie where it's just, it's a simple human story, you know, and it just, it really nails that on the head. So you know, Chef, uh, I would definitely recommend checking it out. It's a, just a really good kind of really short watch movie. All right. So our last story, you know, we, t we tend to get stories that are like not super movie related because we want to relate the stories back to movies. But, you know, this week I wanted to have just a, a movie story, a, a something, a something that was announced this week that for me is now probably my most anticipated movie coming out next year. And that's it was just announced that Michael B. Jordan is going to be the director. He's going to make his directorial debut, Creed Three, And I cannot wait. The Rocky franchise, one of my favorite franchises. The Creed movies, so good. Where are you on the Rocky and Creed? Have you been a fan? Um, you know, I'm a little bit hesitant about Creed Three, just because I feel like they wrapped up the story so well in Creed Two that it probably could have been the end right there. So I'm a little curious to kind of see where they go with the story. But I believe Ryan Coogler, who kind of helmed the first two, is still involved with this one, even if Michael B. Jordan is directing, which I'm always eager to see an actor's directional debut as well, because it could be it could be pretty interesting. It could be really good. It could be not that good. But, you know, A Star is Born, that was Bradley Cooper's first directional debut, and that was really good on his part. But so I'm cautiously optimistic about where creed 3 could go but i will say that i really really like the first two so kugler he wrote and directed the first creed and then i don't believe he had anything at all to do with the second one the second one was written by stallone and then directed by steven something steven cabler or something like that cage or something like that and it was good but i that's a that's a point is that i love that this one says kugler is coming back for this one. And he, I think the story he's getting a story by credit for it because he, he created the story, which I'm, I'm 100% in for Cause I think like, I think I've said it before. I love Ryan Coogler. I think that guy is one of the best recent directors. And, um, I, I, and, and that guy, that guy can tell a great story. And then it's like exactly what you said. You hit the nail on the head with like Michael B. Jordan, I think is going to, going to be a great director because he has worked with some great directors and that's where you get, you know, you have your Ben Affleck and your Clint Eastwood's man. And they, they, they spent their career soaking up everything from the directors they worked with. And they came out and just are phenomenal directors, man. And so I, I, I feel Michael B. Jordan is going to be in that, in that same breath of, of like phenomenal actors turns to actors turn directors. Yeah, I feel like this one definitely has potential for sure. And I'm eager to see where it goes because, again, like I said, it seems like they kind of wrapped the story up in the second one. But there is still, of course, room to go further and to explore different things. So, you know, I'm looking forward to this one. Like, I'll see what, hap what happens and probably check it out in theaters if we can go back to theaters in 2022. Who knows? But I have a feeling we may have picked the same movie on this one. We probably didn't. I went with a Rocky movie, but I don't think we picked the same one. So I went first for this one. I'll say, please bring back Sylvester Stallone because any Rocky based movie, it has to have Stallone in it in some breath. Mm, um, I, I will really quickly disagree with you on that because I feel like, again, story wise with the second one, that could have been the character Sylvester Stallone's grand exit. And, you know, because he had a happy ending at the end of the second one, I'm not going to say what it is because it's still sort of a new movie. But I feel like maybe if they wanted to make Creed movies past the third one, that for this franchise to expand and to really kind of keep becoming its own thing separate from the Rocky movies, then maybe they leave Sylvester Stallone in the first two and that they continue to just explore Michael B. Jordan's character separate from him. Yeah, I can see it either way. It's just I I love Stallone. I, I just I want Stallone to win an Oscar, man. I think I, he got screwed at that Oscar a couple of years ago for Creed. So I, I'll pick my movie. So my personal all time favorite Rocky movie is Rocky Balboa. So that's my pick. 
And um, I know everybody's like the first one's the greatest, but for me, man, Rocky Balboa came back and it was, it was, it was great. It wasn't like the sports movie that the first, you know, five were really. This one came back and it was like, he had been beaten down by life. His wife had died. He owned this restaurant. He was a little bit just world, world, world torn from everything. It was just, and like, for my money, one of the greatest speeches in movie history is when he's talking to his son on the street outside his restaurant. He says, you know, it ain't about how hard you can hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. And for me, I have that poster. I bought that poster and I have it hung up in my basement. It is, it, it, it's probably my all time favorite speech of any movie ever. I'm with you where that speech is an all timer. That's a really good one. And I'll be honest, I haven't seen this particular Rocky movie, but I feel like a lot of people would probably disagree with you that this is the best one in the franchise when you have the original Rocky, you have Rocky 2, a lot of people love Rocky 4, you know, so I will probably say that you're maybe in the minority on this one, but, you know, I was really hoping we we both picked the same movie on this one, I guess not, but, you know, it's, it's, it's good that you kind of enjoyed this one with what it tried to do because it was different. It, it was certainly a different approach and a different way of doing the movie that the previous ones had, it kind of went in a little bit of a different direction with what it was trying to do. Yeah. 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 I, uh, that's another movie experience with a family member. My brother, my brother's an all time favorite series is, is Rocky. And uh, every year on his birthday, I watch a Rocky movie in honor of my brother. And, um, and, and, uh, that was one where I was in college and I came home from college and it was in theaters. And I was like, Hey, hey, buddy, come on, let's go see this Rocky movie. So me and my brother went to so, so, so you know, perhaps that flavors my love of the movie. You know, I, I was able to see a Rocky movie in the theaters with my brother, you know, his favorite franchise. And, but again, hey, man, it's great writing. And Stallone is a great writer. man. And to, if you're a screenwriter, Stallone has to be one of your heroes. The story of how he sold the original Rocky, one of the greatest stories in movie history, I think. Yeah, so I will say I went with the pretty straightforward, simple pick for the story, which is the first Creed. So, you know, I really love this one. It's one of my favorite sports movies. It's a great movie in general. And it's funny because when I heard someone describe this movie to me when it first came out, it sounded actually kind of bad on paper because the way that they were describing it and the premise for it, oh, it's another Rocky movie. And he's in it and he's training a new guy and it's going to be a reboot and all this kind of stuff. And it just didn't really sound that appealing on paper. But then I kept hearing so many people praise it that went to see it. And at the time I was living in Philadelphia and it takes place in the city. So I thought, all right, I may as well go see it. And I absolutely loved it. It kind of delivered on these expectations that people were laying for it. And, you know, I just, I really loved it. And, you know, the second one was really good. It was a true continuation of the story from the first one. And, you know, can we talk about that sequence in the first Creed, the one take fight that they had, you know, kind of, I think it was about halfway through the movie where he fights somebody and the whole scene is done in one take. Huh. I'll say I maybe knew that but i didn't that's not yeah I did, maybe i didn't know that i didn't know that i can't believe you weren't aware of that you know because you, you're you're always you're always really good for these bits of trivia and film knowledge and the behind the scenes for these different scenes and movies so i can't believe you didn't really know that so like go back and watch that because it's really great they do this fight it's about maybe halfway in the movie where michael b jordan it's his first kind of big fight and they do the entire scene in one take I don't know how they did it or how they were able to pull it off or make it look realistic with the punches and how they were landing, but just a great scene and a great piece of filmmaking, which is why I agree with you about Ryan Coogler. I can't wait to see anything that guy does next. Yeah, I will have to go back and watch that now because that would be interesting. It's kind of like, you know, there's a couple of times there's, there's shots that are one take, but I, maybe that that's, that's, uh, a tribute to how great that scene is that I didn't really notice it was a single take done because those are the best scenes. But yeah, dude, Creed, Creed came out. I, I will say, dude, I was upset when Stallone lost the Oscar that year. Yeah, I was, I, I, I think I've said I'm an awards show aficionado and 
I was he was the front runner that year. People were like, he's going to get the Oscar this year is, is because he didn't get it for the original Rocky. He deserved it. And then uh, it was Mark Rylance who won for Bridge of Spies, which phenomenal performance. But dude, it was almost like the 49ers lost the Super Bowl again when the when they didn't call so Stallone's name for that Oscar for Best Supporting Actor. I was like, I, I felt it in me. I was like, how could they not give it to Stallone, man? It's like a lot. It's the way probably a lot of people felt when Leonardo DiCaprio kept missing out on Oscars, when people thought for sure he was going to win it, that he deserves one and he needs at least one. And people kept kind of edging him out over the years before he finally did win one for The Revenant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guess I shouldn't be so invested in the Oscars because it's like it's kind of like that Robin Williams story. A week goes by and it's back to, hey, Mork. So let's wrap up this episode this week with our movie of the week. So it's not a, a new release one because there aren't that many of them these days coming out, but it's a new movie to me, and that's the movie Point Break. So I literally just watched this last night, Thursday night, before this filming on Friday. So I will say that this is really entertaining. It's not the... the, the the most concise, best, well-acted, or a tight script movie you're going to find. Not by any means, but it is certainly a very entertaining B-movie, for sure. Yeah, that's, uh, I, I probably hadn't seen this movie in 20 years or something, and so I actually also watched it last night, and it was like watching it for the first time, because I didn't really remember too much about it. And... The, the thing that strikes me after not seeing it so long is how much your favorite film series, The Fast and the Furious, that first movie took from Point Break. I mean, there are, there are moments in, the, in that movie that were like, it seems like Fast and the Furious beat for beat took. Like there's a, a raid scene that is the wrong bad guys. And that's like exactly the scene in, in Fast and the Furious. Uh, it's, it's, it, that was interesting to see that yeah, I will say, unlike The Fast and the Furious, I think this one balanced that really well, that blend of, you know, B-movie and quality where, you know, some of the, the stunts and shots were pulled off well. But, you know, I don't think it really tried too hard or be something that it's not, where it was just, at the end of the day, really entertaining, just almost a little unintentionally silly, but still just very entertaining watch where, you know, Fast and Furious maybe for me doesn't have that balance down as well. But, you know... This one was just so entertaining, and Keanu Reeves, this was kind of towards the beginning of his career, so I think he had to learn to walk in this movie so his acting could run later in his career. You know, he wasn't really that great in the movie acting-wise, but he certainly goes for it. So it certainly is a, a very kind of, you know, fun movie to watch. Oh yeah, I mean, I am a uh, I, I am a Keanu Reeves fan. I love Keanu Reeves, and if you ever read Hollywood stories or anything, he's like apparently like the nicest guy in Hollywood. He's like one of the best people in Hollywood. Even giving up his paycheck for like the Matrix sequels or whatever to make sure people got paid when this when they ran out of money and stuff. I mean, he, he's I, I love Keanu Reeves, and and honestly, man, you know the movie was directed by Catherine. Bigelow, who's the first woman to ever win an Oscar for The Hurt Locker. Um, and so, yeah, and and, and just, I'm a, I am like beach shots and stuff. Like, I'm a redhead, so I don't get to go to the beach too often because I'll burn to a crisp. But, like, I love that type of photography and the photography in this movie from from the, from the surfing shots to the, to the skydiving scene, man. It's all, it's just great photography. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. I really appreciated when I was watching it, the surfing shots. You know, it, it left me wondering how they captured those and how they were able to really nail those shots, which, of course, it's a movie about bank robbing surfers, which is ridiculous in and of itself. But, you know, you think, OK, they really have to nail the surfing part of it. They really have to make it look great and look fun and, you know, kind of really bring something different to the table. And they really did, you know, the photography, you know, the cinematography for that was just great. The water shots, the wave shots, the surfing, it just, you know, it really came together well. Oh, yeah. And yeah, it was, uh, so, you know, Patrick Swayze was like, guys like the king of the 80s, man. Roadhouse, that, Dirty Dancing, the guy was 
That was a great actor. He passed away far, far too soon, man. He was, he was a phenomenal actor. And I think that's watching this, man, you're just like, that's like his, I feel like that's his quintessential role, man. He just, you can tell he loved that movie. You can tell he loved making that movie. I mean, Patrick Swayze has a bunch of roles that he's famous for, but, you know, he certainly is great opposite Keanu Reeves in this one. And again, it's it's a movie about bank robbing surfers, so don't expect Oscar-worthy acting, but it certainly is fun to watch the two of them kind of go back and forth. So, you know, certainly an entertaining B-movie kind of watch if you're looking for something like that. I'd known about it beforehand, but hadn't really seen it all the way through. So I will say after you watch it, if you check it out, certainly go to Screen Junkie's Honest Trailer video for Point Break because it, it's so funny and kind of pokes fun a lot of the, the premise and the different things from the movie. So it's definitely a funny kind of comedy video about it, the Honest Trailer from Screen Junkies on Point Break if you want to check that out too. I'll check that out. And I did see the remake when that came out. And I'll say not a good remake, but it was shot in 3D. Phenomenal 3D. But I, I hoped we could avoid talking about the, the remake because it seemed like when that came out, it had no interest, no big name actors in it, and nobody really asked for it. You know, it just it seems like a very unnecessary one of these examples of this movie didn't need to be made. And it's certainly, again, going back to this, this Honest Trailer video, which you know what, I'll actually link in the description if you're watching this on YouTube, I'll link it in there. But, you know, it certainly seems like that movie, nobody asked for it. Nobody showed up to see it. It's just one of these exercises in this movie didn't need to happen. It was a bad idea. I can't add anything to that other than what you just said now. So thank you for tuning in. If you're watching, listening, another episode of Life Imitating Movies, weekly podcast where we comb the internet for news stories from the past week and then talk about the movies that have already been made that relate to them. So we really appreciate everybody for tuning in, for listening, watching. You know, we're not doing this for a following, but certainly would be nice to have an audience that enjoys what we're talking about and maybe takes some of our recommendations to heart and really kind of check out some new movies. So we certainly appreciate it, and thank you for tuning in. Yeah, man. I'll say I know one of my really good friends, is he says he listens every week, so hey, Adam. Um, <laughs> apart from that, dude, yeah, dude, I think – I think this week is a week that, you know, I tend to pick some movies that maybe you haven't heard of, but I feel like this week we, we had a solid lineup of flicks. Absolutely. So we'll be back again, new episode weekly. We put out new episodes Monday, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, so be on the lookout for them. And thanks again for tuning in.